When was the last time you thought about happiness? And if there are simple things that you can do to live a happier life? Well, I sat down with Light Watkins, who's famous for taking minimalism to the extreme. In fact, he's been living the last few years out of a single backpack. But we connect to find out if there's a way for us to stop being so stressed out and overwhelmed and tired all the time. And here's what we've got coming up. So what will make us happy? I'm a big proponent of the inside out approach to happiness. You're either achieving to try to be happy or you're achieving because you're happy. This wasn't you backpacking. This is you living out of a backpack. I felt so liberated because I could literally go anywhere. I thought that would be an interesting challenge to just live from the carry-on bag. If you don't have a place to go back to, then you're just fully wherever you are. Is there a way to make meditation not boring? You take the minimalist approach to meditation. The problem is most people are doing too much in meditation. Celebrate your thinking mind. Don't thought shame yourself. Don't feel any sort of judgment around your thoughts. That's the secret. Welcome to The Mark Drager Show, where we explore the minds and the stories of extraordinary entrepreneurs, creatives, and total badasses. So Light Watkins, we know that people say money and success and achievement and career and the planes and the cars and the islands and that fancy relationship that looks so good on Facebook. None of those things bring sustained happiness. Deep down inside, they're all material things and they will not make us happy at the end of the day. So what will make us happy at the end of the day? (laughs) Oh, man, that's a good question. And um, I'm a big proponent of the inside out approach to happiness. And look, there's nothing wrong with private islands and yachts and flying, you know, first class or private. I'm a big fan of all that, too. But if you haven't stabilized a degree of happiness inside, it's going to be very difficult to find happiness through achievements. And sometimes my message gets mistaken as an anti-achievement message. And that's not what I'm saying at all. Again, I'm all about the luxury life, but I'm pro awareness. I'm pro presence. I'm pro stabilizing happiness inside. And the quickest way that I've found to do that is through practices like meditation, gratitude, random acts of kindness, being of service, living a purposeful life, and all of those wonderful things. I've quoted this philosopher, uh, author Schopenhauer, who said that it's difficult to find happiness inside, but it's impossible to find it anywhere else. And that pretty much sums it up. I, <laughs> I like that. I like that. Um, And the reason I want to start with that question is because I've been struggling for a few years, you know, as an entrepreneur, I want like, I I want nice things and I want wealth and I want security and I want to go off and do really cool things and to be able to give my family and uh, the life that I feel like I want to give them. I wouldn't say they deserve. I don't think anyone deserves any of this, but the life that I want to give them and for me and my wife to have the things that we want to have, like achievement and money is important. And pre-COVID, I was really focused on that. And then during COVID, I was like, maybe there's more, you know, maybe there's more to all of this stuff. But then I found it really hard to get motivated. I found it really hard to do something. And so I, like a few weeks ago, I was speaking to someone who is very much in the new age movement, um, uh, very much focused on energy and yoga and um, just, I, I don't want to use the wrong term, but you know, the type of people, the people who like are really plugged in with spirituality and all of this stuff. And she goes, yeah, but Mark, you have to understand none of them have any money, so they can't afford to buy any products, but entrepreneurs have money. And I'm like, so is that it? Like the answer is like, either it's like hustle, like crazy and go make some money or be maybe kind of happy, I guess, but you don't have anything. <laughs> Man, you know, you hear a lot of these internet motivational guys talk these days about how really you shouldn't even strive to be happy because it's not possible to really be happy. And I think that uh, I think there's a big misconception of what that actually means. Like being happy doesn't mean walking around with a smile plastered on your face 24 seven or you know, having a sort of uh, take it as it comes approach to living. Like, I'm a big believer in a both and approach. Yes, you should achieve because that achievements lead to a purposeful life if you're achieving from the right place, right? Here's the real distinction we want to make for your listeners. 
you're either achieving to try to be happy or you're achieving because you're happy. And those two distinctions are going to make you achieve in two different directions. One will make you sacrifice everything, your health, your relationships, your sanity, your integrity in order to win the capitalist game. And there are a lot of people who are playing like that. You know, I'm going to just work around the clock. I'm going to grind myself down to the bone. I'm going to hustle and I'm going to make more money than the next guy because it's a zero sum game. And if I'm not as big and as powerful and as strong as I can be, then somebody's going to take advantage of me. I'm not going to have fuck you money. I'm going to have to be somebody's slave, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The other way is I'm going to achieve what I need to achieve in order to create the space to cultivate happiness inside for however long that takes. And that may take five years, say it's a five-year-long process. So that means I'm going to dedicate as much time, attention, and focus to my inner happiness and we'll replace the word happiness with fulfillment because that's a lot easier on the conscious to spend time becoming fulfilled inside because that's ultimately what the other guys are trying to achieve. They're trying to achieve fulfillment through capitalism. So I'm going to, I'm going to dedicate as much time and effort as possible becoming fulfilled as I am to my internet marketing, to scaling my business, to customer acquisition, to getting, you know, leads and, and, and that kind of thing. And as a result, I'm going to inform my decisions of what to do next once I start getting bigger and bigger based on what I'm feeling, based, based on the fulfillment inside. And what that fulfillment is giving me that the other person is not getting, this is giving me a stronger connection to my intuition and it's giving me higher discriminating power, which means I'm able to discern, I'm able to prioritize a lot better. I'm able to intuit whether it's most important in this moment to send that email or to play with my kids. Or whether it's most important to go to the gym <laughs> or to get on a Zoom call, right? To scale something. And whether I'm going to have a bigger impact in my business if I am in a certain internal condition versus sacrificing that or seeing that as secondary and placing all of my attention and energy on business growth. Because as I've said before, you can buy back your time. You can have all the free time in the world, but if you're not present with it, if you haven't cultivated presence within, then effectively you're squandering your time because that means you're going to be future focused on what's not happening or you're going to be past focused on what you're regretting. So um, so that's the value of presence. And if someone were to tell you that you don't deserve presence, you don't deserve to have any time off, if you don't deserve to prioritize the things that you think are important in your life, how would you feel about that? Right? Obviously, I, you I think I think you. most of us listening though hear that all day every day because it's our own voice telling us that. Exactly. You're telling yourself the thing that you would be offended if somebody else told you. And the reason you'll be offended is because deep down, you know that you deserve those things. So why aren't you giving them to yourself? So I know that in a previous interview, you mentioned uh, the book Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Mm, You got Uh, it right there. I I got it right here. And when I heard that, I was like, ooh, okay. Most people don't mention this. Now, I only heard of this (laughs) book from from Phil Jackson, uh, the coach for the 90s Bulls and then the 2000 uh, LA Lakers, I want to say. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) Anyway, in his book, 11 Rings, he talks about how he used to give away uh, a different book. He'd pick a different book for each of his players to read each summer. And I was like, well, if it's good enough for him to give away to people, I'm going to go ahead and read it. Man, it's a tough read. (laughs) It's a really hard read, but you you just mentioned... It's not a light afternoon read. You're not going to finish it in a day. It's it's like a a Dao Te Ching. You have to take your time with it. Yeah. And so I don't know how much you subscribe to what's written in the book, but you were just talking about achievement and the difference between, you know, when you're achieving for happiness, that's different than when you are happily achieving. And when you are mm-hmm. in a place of happiness and then that happiness is fueling good works and, and achievement. And, you know, there's this line from the book that just what you said reminded me of it. You know, 
Uh, and in the story, he's climbing a mountain with his son and he's going on this big trip. And he says, you know, when you try to climb a mountain to prove how big you are, you almost never make it. And even if you do, it's a hollow victory. In order to sustain the victory, you have to prove yourself again and again in some other way and again, driven forever to fill a false image, haunted by the fear that the image is not true and that someone will find out that is never the way. And I was like, man, so much of what we're trying to do these days is to just one up our past self or to stay on top of things or to try and keep up with this feeling of like we're falling behind. And um, it's overwhelming. And I kind of believe that until you get burnt out, until you hit the point where you, you finally go like, listen, no money, no amount of money's worth this. And I've hit that point. I know other people who go like, I don't care, like whatever, take my company, fire, every, like no amount of money is worth this. I am out. Um, we, we don't want to hit that point. <laughs> so what are some tools or what are some ways in your experience that we can make sure that we're not just pursuing the achievement for achievement's sake, that we're not waiting until we get so burnt out that we're like, burn the thing to the ground because I'm out. And how do we start mm -hmm. to find that happiness within us? So that way we're not doing these things for happiness, but we can find it first. Cause I actually struggle with this. Well, those are two very extreme um, perspectives. One being no amount of money. Oh, is welcome worth to my this. head. <laughs> <laughs> one being no amount of money is worth this, and the other one being you know I'm living a, the life of my dreams type of a thing. And so um, you know it's kind of I'm going to use a very crude example. Okay, please don't make a reel out of this unless you really want to. But let's say you're a porn star. Okay. Oh, come on, man. Yeah, you can't say, you can't say, don't make a reel out of this and then lead off with internet gold. <laughs> Let's say you're a porn star, you're in the middle of a scene and you're doing like the most wretched scene possible in pornography. And you have a come to Jesus moment with yourself and goes, no amount of money is worth this. You know, it's, there's so many choices that happened before you got to that point that you, where you could have pulled yourself back. The idea is not to get to that point. <laughs> Light, you've completely light, light, light. Hold on, hold on. Why did that image, why did this <laughs> analogy come to mind? I know you do a lot of talks. I know you speak from a lot of stages. You've written best selling books. <laughs> because why'd your mind the, go there, man? <laughs> because when you're in a job or you're in a situation, mostly like work situations, is what you're talking about. See, we don't equate it with things like that, but that's exactly what it is. You've sold yourself out, you didn't bet on yourself. And so you've lost your dignity at the job that you're in. And you think it's different from somebody who did the same thing in pornography, but it's really not. And I think if people see it accurately for what it is, like anyone would say, okay, there's no way I'd be on a porn set. I wouldn't sell myself out like that. But then you go to this job that you ate where you're crying on the way to, to work and from work and your coworkers are all selling themselves out, you know? So yes, you are in that same kind of situation. And if you can see it like that, then it can kind of pull you out of it to look at it objectively for what it is. And then you can make a different choice. Now, by the time you're in that, maybe you've gotten a different an apartment that relies on your salary. You can't just pull out right away. No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dude, this is so going to be a real. <laughs> <laughs> you know, unless you want that level of uncertainty where how, how am I going to pay my bills? I got to go get a new job. Now I've got this other thing on my resume that I don't want to talk about. You know, and that's how people relate to the jobs that they don't like. So it's not that your job needs to be your purpose, but you just have to understand that you want to make choices from a purposeful place. And so in the book that I wrote, Travel Light, I talk about identifying your value system. What are, what are the things that are most important to you and, and a very simple way to identify those values is to think about the end of your life and what do you want people to say about you because we all no matter how altruistic you are you want you we are are vain enough to think what are what do we want people to remember us for and usually it's not for how much money you made it's not because you pay, you made you paid your bills on time or anything. that's not what people are going to say at the podium during your eulogy during your celebration of life chances are People are going to get up there and say things about you that were service oriented. You helped someone out in some way, maybe that you don't even remember right now. You were kind to someone when you didn't need to be kind. You were patient when you didn't need to be patient. You were generous. 
you were compassionate when you didn't need to be. So then those more those would be more of your value system. You know, I want to be the kind of person that is a mentor to people who are come to me and they're struggling. I want to be the kind of person who's compassionate. I want to be the kind of person who's giving back in some way. You know, I want to be the kind of person that do- volunteers, that donates. Okay, so now you have your values. That's your editor. That's your filter. That's your screen for every choice you're making. Not just your job, but are you going to go to the gym today? Why would I go to the gym? I don't have time. Well, if you want to be the kind of person that gives back, that means you have to be in the best shape that you can be in so that you can have the energy and the effort to go the extra mile when it comes to giving back. So that's the reason why you go to the gym. That's the reason why you apologize when you have a relationship argument because you don't have time to be stewing in this resentment and negativity. You have to put that attention on the things that you value the most, which could be your kids and, you know, keeping the family together and these kinds of things. So once you solidify your value system, then you can make choices a lot easier. And that's what I was talking about with learning how to prioritize and and discern what's most important. In other words, is this in alignment with my values or is it not in alignment with my values? And if you come across enough choices that you can't really place which value system it applies to, then you tweak your values, okay? What's another value that fits the category of those decisions and treat it like this kind of living system through which you filter your choices. And then I think you'll start to be able to make those choices a lot easier before you get to the gangbang scene (laughs) where you have to come to Jesus moment. That way you spared yourself from all of that or or the corporate version of that. Yeah. The corporate version is like you walking out, flipping off the bosses, flying the papers in the air, telling everyone to take a hike. Uh, And so as you were describing all that, though, the thought that it sounds like we're swimming around when we talk about values, it sounds like we're swimming around purpose as well and direction, all these things. Uh, How important are values versus goals. I've heard some people say, you know, if you have a clear goal, that's the only thing that matters because you just got to know kind of hopefully where you're kind of going to get, but you don't know how you're going to get there. I've heard other people say that, you know, your value sets are the most important things because you just stick to your values. And then as each thing comes to you, you know, you can filter it properly. Do you see those as connected, different? How do you rank them? Values are your foundation. That's, that helps you determine which goals to set. So your goals are all pointing towards or from your values. So it's how can I, again, become this person who does X, Y, and Z? Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to host a a marathon for foster kids. Okay. That's the goal. And the goal is an extension of my value set. And it's not that I'm going to host a marathon for the foster kids in order to become um, compassion, compassionate or to give back in that way, it's I'm already, I want to be the person that gives back in that way. So let me, let me get still enough and quiet enough and see what's marinating in my consciousness. And that's the thing that people, I think, underappreciate is that these goals that we have to do things like that, you know, Marathon for Foster Kids, they come through us. It's not that you have to sit down and think, how do you want to give back? There's a million ways to give back. And possibly you've already been thinking of the way that you are uniquely qualified to help give back. There was a guy that I had on my podcast who he grew up in a homeless shelter. Him and his brothers and his mom were in a homeless shelter. And he had a very low self-esteem. And then in high school, he's trying to hide the fact that he lives in a homeless shelter. He's walking around with his head down all the time. The track coach stops him and says, you know, get your chin up. And then they start talking. And then the track coach recognizes the guy is kind of low self-esteem, a little insecure. He invites him to come try out for the track team. Guy had never run track in his whole life. Turns out he was a natural. He started excelling. Next thing you know, he's running for the Nike track team after high school. And years later, he ends up going back to mentor kids at the same homeless shelter where he grew up. And he's trying to teach them the same thing that his coach taught him, you know, to have a higher self-esteem. He says, let's do something. Let's do something big. Oh, 
let's do a marathon. Let's host a marathon in Hollywood to raise money for homeless shelters. And they needed to raise a million dollars to shut down Hollywood Boulevard. Obviously, you know, he got a lot of pushback, overcame a lot of obstacles, but eventually they pulled it off. They pulled it off. And so that idea that he had was something that no one else could have possibly had. He was uniquely qualified with his running background, with his homeless shelter background to propose that. And it appeared as though it just came off the top of his head. But I would argue that it's something that was deeply embedded in his spiritual DNA. That was a part of his path. And I, I believe that we all have our version of that. So for me, it's living from a backpack for five years and writing a book called Travel Light and being on podcasts like yours talking about this stuff. That's what lights me up inside. I'm uniquely qualified to do that. And for you, it's the things that you're doing. And so again, um, it's not about comparing yourself to the guy who hosted the marathon or to me or to you. It's about people getting quiet enough to see what's marinating within themselves. And then that idea is probably going to exceed your current level of resources and possibly even your current belief in yourself. All you have to do is take the next step. That's normal. We've all felt it. I'm sure you felt it before you started your podcast. I certainly felt it. I was I almost, almost talked myself out of launching my podcast because I just didn't like the audio quality in the first few episodes. And, um, and that was 150 episodes ago. And I, I just laugh now thinking about how I almost didn't launch this thing because I didn't like the little glitches in the first few episodes. And thinking about the power and the um, just the gravity of all the conversations I've had and the ripple effects it's had around the world, and it's ridiculous. But I couldn't have seen myself doing the things that I'm doing now 10 years ago. And that's normal. It's normal. I've, I've said before, you know, everybody living at their edge in their authentic authenticity has imposter syndrome, ironically. When you're authentic and you're doing the things that, that are in your spiritual DNA, you have imposter syndrome. And if you don't have that, then that's a call to go further. I There's so much to cover off there. Um, and I think, you know, that quote from Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance about climbing the mountain and you got to keep doing it because you're worried someone might find out. That's exactly what we're talking about. It's, you know, the imposter syndrome that comes from it. Um, and it almost can sometimes feel like a luxury, though. Like for anyone listening who goes, well, that's great for light. That's great for Mark. Um, I think if you're listening to this show, you know that we believe that you got to pursue your passions. Um, that the sustained, the, the amount of work it takes to be truly great at anything requires an energy and a passion to be able to continue to pull you through the hard times. And so... Um, I think that can come down to values and come down to purpose and things like that. Um, but I'm curious, why did you choose to live out of a backpack? Uh, and only like, were, this wasn't you backpacking. This is you living out of a backpack. Yeah. And look, for clarification, I wasn't like underneath a bridge with my backpack, you know, <laughs> stoking fires in my cooking marshmallows and hot dogs. We've, we've had people on the podcast who have, who, who chose to do that for a few months. <laughs> yeah, no, I've been living in very nice places, <laughs> traveling business class. You know, I just so happened to not own uh, much outside of my backpack. So I got the call. I got the call. You know, I, I, honestly, Mark, I stay in imposter syndrome. I still have it right this moment. You know, there's things in my life that are happening. And I'm like, I don't know if I'm ready for that. I, I feel like I'm going to be exposed, you know? And so five years ago, I just had a book come out. And I had a bunch of tour dates for the book. And I thought this would be a great opportunity to do this thing that has been marinating in my heart for at least a year, which is to get rid of my two bedroom apartment in Santa Monica and start living from a carry on bag. And I've been traveling a lot, like two weeks out of a month for the, pre the previous three or four years. So I was already technically used to operating uh, from a carry on bag. And I noticed that this cer certain items always made it into the bag and certain items never made it into the bag. And That's how I organize my house. Like I put stuff in the closet, and if my wife or kids do not ask for it for a year, it's gone. Out. 
It's gone. And then yeah, usually exactly. a few, like seven months later, they're like, where's that thing? I'm like, oh, I got rid of that. Yeah. Time. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's better to ask for forgiveness than for permission. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so yeah, I thought that would be an interesting challenge to just live from the carry-on bag. And really it was, a, it was about creating internal resistance to being fully present. And that was a way of cultivating more presence. Because if you don't ever, if you don't have a place to go back to, then you just, you're just fully wherever you are, you know? And that's what didn't my experience Didn't it leave was. you feeling ungrounded? The, the challenge was to become as grounded as I could be wherever I was. Hmm. And I think the question to that is, compared to what okay so obviously you're thinking okay ungrounded compared to being in my apartment well i didn't really feel all that grounded i, I, I felt like at that time of my life i felt like the, the apartment was actually dead weight that's what it felt like i didn't feel a connection to it now if i had a family if i had like the family house that's been in my family for generations maybe that would have been different but that wasn't my experience so, and this is what I'm, I've been saying, you don't have to emulate me. This is just how I experienced this part of my life. And it felt more grounded spiritually to take this leap of faith than it did to stay where I was because I was afraid of what was going to come next. What do you mean? And what I was you afraid, afraid of the uncertainty of not having a place. Mm. Now, let's suppose... Uh, I had a dream or a premonition about a pandemic that was going to come two years from that point and everybody was going to just shelter in place and it was going to last two over two years. If I had known that, I probably would have been tempted to, to <laughs> not do it because then I would have said to myself, well, I'm not going to have a place to go back to if this experiment is still happening and I'm afraid of what's going to happen. And this is what we do. We talk ourselves out because uh, we imagine scenarios where the thing that our heart is calling us to do um, is going to make us in an uncomfortable. And I would argue that's more ungrounded spiritually than taking a leap of faith in some direction that is marinating in your heart. And um, so fortunately, I did not have that premonition. I put myself out there. And guess what? When the pandemic happened, I was fine. I worked it out. I figured it out. Got an Airbnb yeah. for several months, stayed with a friend. In fact, I felt so liberated because I could literally go anywhere. And and now that's what people are doing. They're going anywhere. You know, people are working from Mexico City, working from Croatia, working from all these places and, and realizing I don't have to be in Chicago. I don't have to be in Tennessee. I don't have to be wherever I was. I can literally do this from anywhere. And that's been my life since 2018. I can work from anywhere. So I kind of feel like because I took that leap, I was ahead of the curve by a couple of years. And um, and it's just been so so much more what I've gotten in terms of fulfillment and knowing that if I take that leap, everything is going to work out, the net will appear. That there's value to that. There's value to that in terms of being present. Because now the chances of me talking myself out of doing something because I don't know every little detail um, are so it's so small compared to maybe the same version of me before where I was defaulting towards stability. And so I don't equate stability with groundedness. I equate trusting your heart with groundedness. The more you can trust your heart, the more grounded you are and vice versa. Have you been able to train yourself to get more comfortable with uncertainty? Because um, I think it's some it's a skill that you can develop and it's a muscle that you can work, especially if you continue to challenge yourself and continue to grow. But as you know, behind every mountain is another mountain. Uh, and so as the challenges get bigger, as uh, life goes on, it seems like there's just always an incredible amount of uncertainty. And I'm trying to work right now to reframe it in my mind to say, well, um, as you said, you know, like it'll work out. Future 
Mark has this. They, you know, it's not all gonna burn to the ground. It's not all like you know we're gonna live or we're gonna die. And so um, I'm getting more comfortable with a certain amount of uh, uncertainty. But I almost don't know where the the boundary of recklessness is. And in my mind, it's always like this is reckless. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I you know I think this is a very interesting conversation. The uncertainty question because the thing that comes up for me around that is we live in such a comfortable society, like physically comfortable, materially comfortable that. And we see through social media, other people who look so comfortable, so effortlessly comfortable that it diminishes the amount of work it takes to allow the universe to sort of operate through you. Okay. And what I mean by that is I work really hard, probably harder than people would imagine that someone like me would work. I'm not sitting around trusting the universe is going to provide for me and I don't have to do anything. So that's where a lot of my inherent uh, faith comes from is that I know that I'm going to be okay because I can work my ass off to make myself okay. I'll go out and I'll network my ass off. I'll create courses. I'll make connections. I'll help people in a way that I'm always going to be okay. I'm always going to, as long as I'm (laughs) able-bodied and, uh, and even if I'm not able-bodied, God forbid, you know, I'll figure out a way to make it happen. And I treat people so well in my life that if I'm not able to make it happen for myself, I'll, reach out and ask for help from people that I've helped out. And I have a family, family dynamics that are also pretty reliable and trustworthy. So a lot of that, you know, we could talk up to good luck or good fortune, but I really do try to see my health that I've worked really hard to sustain uh, as a responsibility to give more, to work harder, to go the extra mile, to go above and beyond, to to help other people. And that's, in my estimation, that's my insurance. That's the real health insurance. I've been writing this daily email, this daily dose of inspiration email for seven years, which means I never really slept in for seven years. And I have to decline so many invitations because I need to, I, it's, it's not something I batch, you know, 12 of them and then I just schedule them. No, I send them out every day. Every day I sit with those words, those messages, and I send out the one that I feel is most appropriate for that day. And people hear that and they go, wow, you know, that's a lot. It's a big commitment. And again, it's one of those things where when I hit send the first time in 2016, I didn't really realize how much work it was going to be involved in sending out those emails. <laughs> well, but you've it, sent out 2,500. I mean, like, <laughs> did yeah. you know that you were signing up for that? And for each one, is, we're talking like an hour, you know, of at least... 2,500 hours. <laughs> so, um, and, you know, maybe if I had known that, I wouldn't have hit send. I wouldn't have committed to that. But at the same time, What's interesting, and this is purely anecdotal, I get that. What's interesting is I haven't gotten sick. I haven't gotten too sick to send out those emails in seven years. I haven't had any freak accidents. I haven't broken anything. It's not like I'm walking around, you know, with a helmet on. I'm an active person. I'm in the gym all the time. I'm um, occasionally playing, you know, recreational sports. And you're you're fifty, right? I'm fifty years old. Yeah, I mean, I was reading the Rich Roll. You know, you were on Rich Roll's podcast. I was reading the comments, and I have to say, one of the number one comments were people going, "Holy smokes, this guy's 50. <laughs> For our listeners, you may not realize he looks like he's in his thirties. And you know, I've, I've been very intentional about investing in my health. You know, and, and meditation is a big part of that. I've also written that. I think the thing that's had the biggest change, or it's been the big biggest health benefit for me. It's not meditation. It's when I stopped drinking alcohol 25 years ago. And so that just helps you make better decisions. And I I would argue that I probably would not have even given meditation a shot 
had I still been drinking alcohol. So, and I write about that in my book, Travel Light as well, about the importance of being aware and the opposite state of spiritual minimalism is the state of inebriation and that most of us are functional alcoholics. And the way to test that, stress test that theory, people who push back is, can you go three months without drinking any alcohol? And if you can't, then that means you're a functional alcoholic. A tech, you know, by definition, you're addicted to something that you can't go without. <laughs> if I were to say, can you go without cigarettes for three months and you don't smoke? You're like, yeah, no problem. That's because you're not addicted to it. If you're a smoker and I said, can you go three months without it? You'd be like, uh, you, I can't just have one on the weekend just to take the edge off. You're addicted to it. So replace that with alcohol and that will tell you everything you need to know. And that's fine. There's no judgment around that. But if you want to be able to access that still small voice a lot easier, then you're going to have to stop diluting your consciousness with neurotoxins that are basically um, diminishing that connection. So yeah, I stopped doing that at 25 and then it was like, you know, dominoes after that. I started meditating, started exercising religiously, um, did a lot of yoga. I was a yoga teacher for a while. So for whatever, again, for whatever good fortune, I, I recognized the value in that and, and intentionally thought to myself, I'm investing in my future every time I do this, but I would extend it even into our purpose. So writing those emails, I saw that as this is a part of my health insurance. This is a part of my uh, of me maintaining my mind, body, mental, spiritual health, having something that you are uniquely qualified to do or that you feel called to do will keep you safe. It'll help you be in the right place at the right time more often than not. So again, for your listeners, if you don't have something like that, I, rec- I highly recommend finding something painting yourself into a corner, committing yourself to something that's difficult, finding comfort in that discomfort, and that will go further in keeping you healthy than the thing you pay to Blue Cross Blue Shield every month. What would you say your superpower is? I would say my superpower is making this stuff accessible and relatable because I'm not airy-fairy in spite of my name being light and in spite of the fact that I'm a big proponent of practices like meditation. I think when people hear that, they probably have expect me to be talking about, you know, stuff and taking yeah, like, shoes like off. Bullshit. And, yeah. yeah, exactly. Stuff that you can't really relate to or verify or validate. But I'm, I think I'm very good at making this stuff accessible and relatable to guys, especially because I'm a guy's guy. I like, I love football. I love dating. I love, you know, wrestling and everything. You know, I'm not a huge fan of mixed martial arts, but I can, I can get into it. If it's a, <laughs> if I can buy into the story behind it, you know, yeah, I can get into it. Um, the reason, the reason I ask about the superpower is because often um, we were earlier, we were talking about, you know, like, listen, I don't worry because I know I can always work hard and I know as long as my body holds out, I can do these things and I can bounce back and I can get back and there's time. When we speak about purpose, when we speak about values, when we speak about all these things, it's like sometimes I think people overlook that, like we, we, we talked about, we have this innate skill, we have this innate quality, we have this innate gift. We, we have something within us that often we overlook because it comes so natural to us. And um, I kind of believe that that's our insurance policy. Like if you know that you are very good at taking these, what can be um, philosophical, or spiritual or woo-woo or touchy-feely type things and making them real, making them grounded, making sure that, you know, all people can access them um, and making, make, you know, having an impact on people. I mean, that's a huge transferable skill you can take anywhere. And I'm only using you as an example because for myself or for anyone who's listening, you know, we've talked about values, we've talked about purpose, we've talked about goals, we've talked around all these things. But to me... I feel like your superpower is the thing that you should go all in on because that's the light, that's the fire, that's the energy, that's the thing that that you bring to the world that no one else does. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I, honestly, I wouldn't be confident in that assessment had I not taken on that commitment of that daily email because that was a way for me to practice writing, or practice storytelling, um, to practice being accessible. Because when I started out, um, I definitely wasn't as pithy as I can be these days where, you know, you can say something and it does a better job of summarizing a, a different, a complex concept than before I'd have to write five paragraphs to do the same thing. So, 
Um, you, you wouldn't know, have come up porn. with a porn star analogy if, porn if it wasn't example. for these. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Great callback. We were both going there. <laughs> <laughs> um, exactly. But everybody who hears that gets it. You get because we've all seen that. You know. I refuse to admit anything on camera. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's the so, difference in so, me and you. I'm, I'm happy to admit it. <laughs> what took us from? What took you from living in a backpack, uh, living in a carry-on bag? To uh, which, which is kind of the external world of minimalism to spiritual minimalism. You've mentioned that term a few times. Help us understand what that means and what's the difference between, you know, trekking out into the world without any anything that you own and this idea of spiritual minimalism. Yeah, people ask me when did I become a minimalist, and what they're expecting me to say is I became a minimalist on May thirty first, twenty eighteen, when I moved out of my two bedroom apartment and into a carry on bag. But the real answer is. I became a minimalist when I started taking my meditation practice seriously back in 2003, after five years of dabbling and being reluctant around this practice. And that's because it's I credit the internal work of creating spaciousness inside, which is what meditation does, with putting me in a position to explore this idea that was marinating in my heart around moving out of that apartment and living from the back. The reason why we, we have a hard time doing those things that our heart is calling us to do, it's not because we don't have the money or because we don't have the resources or because people wouldn't accept it or you know things like that. The reason is because we have emotional baggage. We have outdated belief systems which hold us back. That's the real reason why. And so when you start practices like meditation, it allows you to clear away the internal clutter. And once you clear that away, you find yourself saying yes to yourself and betting on yourself in ways that you would you couldn't have done before. For instance, there's this guy that I was following on Instagram. He's this like he's this like pale white guy from the UK. He's got this like long red beard. And he's balding. And he, you know, on my search feed, I would see this. I I just have to say, as you describe that piece by piece, in my mind's eye, it's like, okay, British person, you know, like looking pretty fancy, maybe you said the UK. And then suddenly you're like, okay, pale, red beard, oh, he's Scottish. And it's just totally visualized it. (laughs) He's got this little cowlick. But I click on one of his videos in the search feed, and he's dancing in the video topless with these tight bell-bottom jeans to like Cardi B or something. And he does these little, his whole feed with these dancing clips of him dancing. And he's not the best dancer, but, you know, he's got rhythm. And so I'm seeing these clip after clip of him dancing, and I'm just imagining how much ridicule this guy probably gets oh yeah posting posting these dance videos on instagram and one day he posts i st- I followed him for a little while and one day he posts his video he's like just walking in the street and he's got his phone out and he's talking into the phone he says guys today is the day i just quit my job and this dance video thing is really taken off i'm able to support myself from this and I'm so happy. It lights me up so much. And uh, I just want to say thank you for your support. And a lot of people would look at that and hear that and think to themselves, oh, that's he just started following his purpose, right? And how wonderful is that his purpose is about making these dance videos. I would argue that he started following his purpose the moment he stopped letting other people's opinions dictate whether or not he was going to post those dance videos. When nobody was watching, when nobody cared, he was showing up day after day, trusting that this is what he's supposed to do, still having to go to this job, still having to defend himself to his family, probably hard to find a girlfriend, you know, all the things. And, and he committed to himself. He bet on himself. And that's when he started following his purpose. And this is my message to the listeners is when you're at that precipice of, do I let my family and my friends' opinions dissuade me from doing the things that I feel naturally curious about? Or 
do I follow my curiosity relentlessly, regardless of what people think, especially if I'm not hurting anybody and I'm doing something that lights me up inside? What I've written about in the book is you don't ever have to even think about your purpose. You just follow your curiosity relentlessly and your purpose will find you. And that guy's example is a perfect example of that. I agree with that at a high level. It's um, really hard. It's really challenging. <laughs> I can just imagine. Yeah, I can just imagine how much ridicule that guy's got. And so I marvel. Um, I'm enamored with courage. Uh, I, whether I like the art or not, I love people who have something to say. And they get up on stage, or they put their voice out there, or they create something, or they make something, or people think they're crazy. Because I can't help but often be the person who's like, I do think they're crazy. <laughs> like, like, why did you think this was a good idea? Why would you do that? And then it works out and I'm like, oh, damn, they're so good. Um, and so I think we have that all, I think we have that within us, this both side of things. Earlier, I mentioned that, you know, it's the voice in our heads that's often the biggest critic. Um, and I think that's the case even with what you're describing. I think it's not what our family will say, it's what we think our family will say whether they say it or not. Um, because we actually have to do it for our family to see it and then say it. So I think even before the guy picks up the camera and starts dancing and getting all the negative feedback and everything else, like he, he has to overcome the fact that he's like, oh man, people are going to see this. People are going to know about this. And um, I'm not sure how we can get bolder at making these courageous things, is doing these things. Is the act of meditation and clearing your mind and all of this stuff a tool that we can use to get bolder, to get stronger, to have more courage, to face those hard things? Are, like, is this one in the same? No, I, I don't think you need meditation to do that. Um, you just need to do it. <laughs> well, no. Meditation is has its utility, and I'll get to that in a, in a second. But I just want to respond to something you said earlier, which is that it's hard. And if, if you think about, and I'm speaking to your listeners now, if you think about Anyone whose life you admire, anyone from history, they had a hard time becoming the person that they became, right? And the two examples that come to mind right now for me are um, Martin Luther King. A lot of people don't realize Martin Luther King was hated by 75% of the Black population, especially when he came out against Vietnam. You know, he got so much pushback. Now, of course, we celebrate him and we have a monument dedicated to him and a national holiday in the States dedicated to him. But while he was alive in the height of his uh, mission, he was despised by more people than the people who liked him. My understanding is and, he wasn't even going to give the I dream, you know, the, the dream speech that he was not going to speak about that. And he was like irked on by a, a woman in his group who was there saying, come on, give that, go ahead, say it, like, do it, come on. Like he had to like be encouraged even to give the, the most famous speech of all time. Well, going further back than that, he had to be encouraged to lead the Montgomery bus boycott, which was the movement that made him famous. The first thing, you know, when Rosa Parks stayed in her seat, uh, he was the young 26 year old preacher that everybody all this, the elders in that community wanted to be, become the leader of this boycott. And this is in the deep South where people are getting lynched. Like people go for coffee these days. Like it was nothing to get killed, lynched, to have your life ruined, be fired from all your jobs and stuff. And so he had to be shamed to step into that leadership position. But this is the thing, you know, when you're living your true purpose, your mission and all of that, it's not going to make you more comfortable. And I think when people understand that, it's going to be hard regardless. Not living your purpose and going to that soul-sucking job is hard and living your purpose is hard, but only one makes you more fulfilled. And because you're more fulfilled, you're able to have access to things within yourself that you wouldn't have access to otherwise. Um, the other example I was going to give is Muhammad Ali, who of course we revere now, but he was also despised for not wanting to go and fight in the Vietnam War. Um, and yeah, anybody you name, Puff Daddy, Prince. Prince got booed. <laughs> Prince opened for the Rolling Stones and came out on stage, man, with some high heel boots and some panties and nothing else on and a, and a bracelet. And that was it, makeup. 
And he got booed. He got all these people who were came to see the Rolling Stones. They threw hot dogs at him. They threw, you know, soda cans at him. And um, and he literally stopped performing and, and left the stage. I mean, Prince, people revere Prince and his body of work now. But back then, he had to earn it. And um, so, yeah, it, it, there's no easy path to your purpose. And we all have to, it's the rite of passage. If people are pushing back, then you know you're doing the right thing. And you just have to, you just have to just keep taking that next step. And eventually, you're going to be, you're going to be on your own. You're going to be on your own, right? And the juxtaposition I like to use is, is the Wizard of Oz. You know, you see the, the scene of Dorothy and the lion and the scarecrow and the tin man and, and Toto and all them walking down the yellow brick road after having exposed the Wizard of Oz. And that's kind of how we see our path for ourselves is that we're going to have all these, all of our best friends are going to be with us and we're going to have this wonderful adventure. But it's more like, I don't know if you saw that movie Dark Knight Rises with Batman and Bane. And, you know, I will admit Bane, that I've never, I've never seen a Dark Knight movie. Okay. Now. So there's a scene where Batman, uh, Bruce Wayne, played by Christian Bell, he gets thrown in this prison that's deep underground and there's this sort of well this cylinder shaped well leading up to the sky and it's like hundreds of feet high and it's a well made of bricks and so it's there by design because as the villain says to batman this is to give you hope and he says the worst kind of despair is to have hope and not be able to do anything about that and so word among the prisoners is that no one has ever escaped from that prison by scaling the wall and uh, except for one person. And then later on, it's revealed that the way the person escaped was they had no safety net because there's this little rope that you could jimmy rig around your waist and then try to climb out. But the rope is not big enough to get you out. Eventually, you got to take the rope off and you just have to go on skill to get to the top. And so long story short, that's what Christian Bell slash uh, Batman ends up doing is climbing out of that. And this is big dramatic scene where he's got to take this leap to this ledge. And that's kind of Spoil what the path... Spoiler alert for a 15-year-old movie. <laughs> yeah. But that's what the path is really like. It's just, you have to do it on your own. There's no safety net. You have to have trust in yourself. You have to bet on yourself. You have to do things that other people haven't been able to do. And, uh, and there's very little certainty of whether or not you're going to do it. And the stakes are as high as they can get. So, um, so if you're feeling like that right now... Chances are you're on your path. <laughs> <laughs> Chances are you're doing the right thing. Um, mm -hmm. I have I, before you go. I do have a few more questions, and I love this conversation. Uh, now, if you are listening and you like what Light is saying, and you want to learn more about um, spiritual minimalism or about uh, meditation or any of the things he speaks about, I didn't really get too much into that. And um, I will admit to you, um, I have not practiced meditation very well. So I hate it because I just, I know that I'm not doing it right. And so that's why I didn't get too much into it because I don't know very much about it to the point where it's like, uh, like I already focus so much on my sleep and my hydration and my exercise and my family and my business and all of these things. It's like, oh man, like how many things do I have to like really focus on? But I have a friend who said like, there are certain things that are the, the dominoes or the keys. Like, like I believe that if you exercise and eat well and focus on your health, that is like an unlock for so many other areas of your life in terms of confidence, in terms of um, uh, pushing through hard things, in terms of when people think that they're sore or tired, they're not sore or tired. There's so much more in them. Um, and so it's like this great unlock. And I, from everyone I've spoken to, meditation is like this great unlock. And yet it's just such a commitment and it's so boring and it takes so much time and I have so many more important things to do. <laughs> and so I feel like I have to ask, what do you say to people who either don't get it? Don't look at me with pity because I know you're going to be like, oh, Mark, I was there once maybe. But but I don't get it. And I'm not sure that I need it. But everyone says that I do. You just reminded me what I was going to say earlier. So meditation is not necessary to be on your path. But what happens is when you're climbing out of the pit of despair, it's very stressful. To put yourself in that position because you have to be in yeah. that position 
Yeah. That's why most people turn to alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> right? Food, alcohol, <laughs> drugs, sex, you know, all the stuff that they turn to because they're like, please numb all this anxiety that I'm constantly carrying. So everybody, to your point, has a way of dealing with stress. Most of those ways of dealing with stress, I call those um, dirty outlets for stress because they come with a host of side effects that are going to uh, you're going to get the bill for later, maybe 10 years later, maybe 20 years, but this, it's coming and it's going to be massive. And you're not going to want to pay it. Meditation is clean, a clean outlet. The only side effects are you become more fulfilled. You become happier. You become more present. You become more grateful. You become more compassionate, more generous, but you have to make the time to do it. So it may be hard to make the time now, but that same difficulty that you're feeling now with making the time, you're going to have to, you're going to have to confront 10 years from now, but it's going to be worse. So um, when you make the time now, it's the same analogy of, you know, being overweight and out of shape is difficult and going to the gym is difficult. But going to the gym is going to make you functionally stronger 10 years from now. Whereas and it's not so boring, though, <laughs> being on the couch. Well, is 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 there a way to make meditation not boring or when you're doing it right it's not because you're so locked in and everything. Yeah, the, the way you make meditation delightful is you take the minimalist approach to meditation and I talk about that in the book Travel White. The problem is most people are doing too much in meditation. You're trying to sit like a monk, you have your back completely straight, you have your palms up or your fingers together your legs crossed, you're sitting on a cushion. None of that is necessary. In fact, it's just getting in the way. So I would recommend, just as a quick little primer, sit your butt on the couch, be natural, like you're going to watch the game. That's how you want to meditate. Okay, Back is supported. You can have your arms crossed. You can have your legs crossed. Whatever you want to do, that's natural. And you close your eyes and... You're naturally going to want to go to battle with your mind, but instead of doing that, I encourage you to um, to celebrate your thinking mind. Don't thought shame yourself and you know this whole "I have a monkey mind" nonsense. That's not true. You don't have a monkey mind any more than someone who's never had piano lessons may say, "I have monkey fingers." You don't have monkey fingers. You just need to take lessons and practice. So as you learn a structured technique and practice, you'll start to see, oh, there's nothing wrong with my mind, except I was shaming myself for having thoughts. Everybody has thoughts. But the only difference in, in me and somebody who's shaming themselves is that I don't shame myself. I celebrate my thinking mind. And you'll notice that when you shift your attitude from shame to celebration and you see your mind is perfectly natural, those thoughts that were drowning your meditation experience will start to fade away on their own. That's the secret. That's the hack. Don't feel any sort of judgment around your thoughts. Oh, <laughs> ah, now you've just uh, unlocked or um, touched on uh, an underlining thing. The lack of judgment. Cause my wife likes to tell me sometimes I reveal my true thoughts to her and she's like, wow, that's really judging. I'm like, yeah, I'm very judgmental of myself and everyone else all the time. That's why I push myself to get better and have such high standards. Cause I'm judging everything all the time. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, I do have to ask you, what is the question I didn't ask you that I really should have? Because you are an expert at so many things. And that's where I was going with the previous question. I mean, if you if you feel like you need to dig more into Light's world, then you got to check him out online. You got to pick up his new book, Travel Light. Uh, it's his fourth book. Um, and you got to obviously sign up for this email newsletter because he's sending out nonstop emails every single day. But uh, what is the question I didn't ask you where you're like, Mark, man, if you close off this show and you don't ask me this question, then your audience will suffer. Um. Maybe you can ask me, how do I know when I'm following my heart? I love it. I love it. I mean, I don't even know that answer. So, so <laughs> hit, us, hit us with it. Yeah, let's dig into that. So the way you know you're following your heart is you're, you're acting upon some idea or nudging or notion 
that's been occupying the back of your mind. Um, and when you think about it and you think about it, fully extrapolated to its conclusion, it makes you feel expensive. So for instance, working out, a lot of people will, happ- will, will happily admit, I don't feel like working out most of the time. And that's not uh, an illusion. Like I don't feel like working out a lot of the time, but I still go to work out because I know how I'm going to feel after I've done working out. And I always feel better about myself leaving the gym than I give myself credit for before I go and to the gym. And so that idea fully extrapolated to me walking out of the gym, it lights me up, makes me feel expansive, you know, feeling stronger, feeling more functionally agile. And so that's what helps me to make that choice to say yes to going to the gym. But that's a really good, I think, example of how the heart communicates with us because it pushes us out of our comfort zone, go to the gym, that pushes you out of your comfort zone. Maybe you'd rather be sitting on the couch watching a show or doing nothing. But there's this vision of what's going to happen once you go to the gym and how that's going to make you feel versus the opposite of that. The opposite of that is go open up a pint of ice cream and eat that because that would taste really good right now. But then if you extrapolate that to two hours after eating the ice cream, you know you're going to feel like shit. You're going to have that sugar rush. You're probably not going to sleep very well. You may even get a headache, right? You're, uh, you're going to feel bloated, perhaps, because maybe your body can't process dairy like that anymore. But you're thinking, oh, I have this short-term craving for all this sugar. So that's not your heart talking to you. That's something else. And we don't have time to get into what those other things could be, but that's not your heart. Your heart is going to almost always push you out of your comfort zone. Even things like go compliment the person. Instead of criticizing someone, give them a compliment instead. Show some appreciation. Oh, but they don't deserve it. They need to hear this critique from me. Well, just appreciate them and see what happens. And you appreciate them. You show appreciation. It turns out that that was what they needed to hear in order to do the thing you wanted them to do organically. But there was a lack of appreciation and maybe they didn't feel like um, they didn't feel like doing the thing that you wanted them to do organically. So once we start to fund these relationships with more appreciation, people just naturally want to be doing things in a better, more positive way because everybody likes being appreciated as opposed to criticized. A lot of people are having that experience, man. And they think the other person needs to change in order for me to be happy. And But really what needs to happen is you need to change. You need to upgrade your perception. And as a result, you may not be so critical of what the other person is doing. You may be able to see them in a different light. 